Siddhartha by Hermann Hayes Chapter 11 Om. The wound burned for a long time. Siddhartha had to ferry many travelers who had a son or a daughter along, and he saw none of them without envying them, without thinking, so many, so many thousands have the sweetest happiness. Why not I? Even wicked people, even thieves and robbers have children and love them and are loved by them, but not I. His thoughts were that simple, without understanding. He had grown that similar to the child people. He now saw people in a different light, less cleverly, less proudly, but also more warmly, more curiously, more sympathetically. When he ferried normal travelers, child people, businessmen, warriors, women, they no longer seemed foreign to him. He understood them. He understood and shared their lives, which were led not by thoughts and insights, but solely by drives and wishes. And he felt like them. Although he was close to perfection and enduring his final wound, he saw these child people as his brothers. Their greed, their vanity, their silliness had lost their silliness for him, became understandable, became lovable, became even venerable for him. A mother's blind love for her child. A conceited father's blind and stupid love for his only little son. A vain young woman's blind, wild striving for jewelry and worshipful male eyes. All these urges, all these childish feelings, all these simple, foolish, yet tremendously potent, powerfully living, powerfully triumphant drives and desires were no longer infantile for Siddhartha. He saw people living for their sake saw them achieving endless things for their sake, traveling, waging wars, suffering endlessly, enduring endlessly. And he could love them for that. He saw life, liveliness, indestructibility, Brahma, in each of their passions, each of their deeds. Lovable and admirable were those people in their blind devotion, their blind strength and tenacity. They lacked nothing. The knower and thinker had nothing over them but a single trifle, a single tiny little thing. The consciousness, the conscious thought of the oneness of all life. And at times, Siddhartha even doubted whether this knowing, this thinking, were so valuable. But that they were not childish things of the thought people. The thought child people, in all other respects, the worldlings were the equals of the sage, were often far superior just as at times animals in their tenacious, unswerving, necessary actions may seem superior to human beings. Slowly blossomed, slowly ripened in Siddhartha the insight, the knowledge of what wisdom actually is, what the goal of his long seeking was. It was nothing but a readiness of the soul, an ability, a secret art to think the thought of oneness, to feel and breathe the oneness at every moment in the midst of life. Slowly, this blossomed in him, brightly emanated to him from Vasudeva's old childlike face, harmony, knowledge of the eternal perfection of the world, smiling oneness. But the wound still burned, bitterly. Siddhartha thought about his son, yearned for him, nurtured his love and tenderness in his heart, let the pain devour him, committed all the follies of love. This flame did not die of its own accord. And one day, when the wound was burning fiercely, Siddhartha, driven by longing, ferried across the river, disembarked, and wanted to go to town and seek his son. The river flowed slowly and gently. It was the dry season of the year, but the river's voice sounded strange. It was laughing. It was clearly laughing. The river was laughing. It laughed clear and bright as the old ferryman. Siddhartha halted. He leaned over the water the better to hear. And in the silently flowing water, He saw his own face reflected. And in this reflected face, there was something that reminded him, something forgotten, and by pondering it, he found it. This face resembled another face. 
that he had once known and loved and also feared. It resembled the face of his father, the Brahmin. And he remembered that ages ago, he, a youth, had forced his father to let him join the penitents. He remembered saying goodbye to him, going away and never returning. Had not his father suffered the same sorrow that Siddhartha was now suffering for his own son? Had his father not died long since alone, without seeing his son again? Would Siddhartha not have to suffer the same fate? Was it not a comedy, a strange and stupid thing, this repetition, this running in a fateful circle? The river laughed. Yes, it was so. Everything not fully suffered, not fully resolved, came again. The same sorrows were suffered over and over. Siddhartha stepped back into the boat and rode back to the hut, recalling his father, recalling his son, laughed to scorn by the river, at odds with himself, inclined toward despair and inclined no less to join the loud laughter at himself and the world. Ah, the wound was not blossoming yet. His heart was still defying fate, serenity, and victory were not yet beaming from his sorrow. Still, he felt hope, and upon returning to the hut, he had an invincible desire to open up to Vasudeva, to disclose everything to him, reveal everything to him, the master of listening. Vasudeva was sitting in the hut, weaving a basket. He no longer worked the ferry. His eyes were starting to weaken, and not only his eyes, but also his arms and his hands. Unaltered and blossoming, were only the joy and the serene benevolence of his face. Siddhartha sat down with the old man. Slowly, he began to speak. He now talked about things they had never spoken of before, about his trip to the town back then, about the burning wound, about his envy at the sight of happy fathers, about his knowledge of the folly of such feelings, about his futile struggle against them. He reported everything. He could say everything, even the most embarrassing things. Everything could be said, everything told, everything disclosed. He showed his wound and told about his flight today, about crossing the water, a childish fleer, willing to walk to town, and he told about the rivers laughing. As he spoke, on and on, and Vasudeva listened with a silent face, Siddhartha felt Vasudeva's listening felt it more intensely than ever before. He felt his own pains and anxieties flowing across to him, his secret hope flowing across and coming back. Revealing his wound to this listener was the same as bathing it in the river until it grew cool and was one with the river. Still speaking, still admitting and confessing, Siddhartha felt more and more that this was no longer Vasudeva, no longer a human being listening to him, that this motionless listener was absorbing his confession like a tree absorbing rain, that this motionless man was the river itself, that he was God himself, that he was eternity himself. And while Siddhartha stopped thinking about himself and his wound, this knowledge of Vasudeva's altered being took possession of him. And the more he felt it and pierced it, the less peculiar it became, the more he realized that everything was right and natural, that Vasudeva had been like that for a long time, nearly always, but that he, Siddhartha, had not fully recognized it, and that he himself was barely different from Vasudeva. He felt that he now saw old Vasudeva, the way the populace sees the gods, and that this could not last. He began to say farewell to Vasudeva in his heart, and he kept speaking all the while. When Siddhartha was finished speaking, Vasudeva gazed at him with his friendly, somewhat weakened eyes, said nothing, silently radiated love and serenity toward him, understanding and knowledge. He took Siddhartha's hand, led him to the seat on the river bank, sat down with him, smiled at the river. You heard it laugh, 
said Vasudeva, but you have not heard everything. Let us listen. You will hear more. They listened. The many-voiced song of the river resounded softly. Siddhartha stared into the water, and images appeared to him in the flow. His father appeared, lonely, mourning his son. He himself, Siddhartha, appeared lonely. He, too, bound with the bonds of yearning for his faraway son. His son appeared, lonely he, too, the boy greedily charging along on the burning path of his young wishes, each person focusing on his goal, each one obsessed with his goal, each one suffering. The river sang with a sorrowful voice, sang ardently, flowed ardently toward its goal, its voice lamenting. Did you hear? asked Vasudeva's mute gaze. Siddhartha nodded. Hear better, whispered Vasudeva. Siddhartha strove to hear better. His father's image, his own image, his son's image flowed in and out of one another. Kamala's image also appeared and dissolved, and Govinda's image and other images flowed into one another. They all merged into the flow. They all flowed as a river toward the goal, ardent, desiring, suffering. And the river's voice was full of yearning, full of burning distress, full of insatiable longing. The river flowed toward the goal. Siddhartha saw it hastening. The river, consisting of him and his near and dear and all the people he had ever seen, all the waves and all the waters, hastened suffering toward goals, many goals. The waterfall, the lake, the rapids, the sea, and all goals were attained, and each goal was followed by another. And the water became vapor and rose to the sky, became rain and plunged down from the sky, became a source, became a brook, became a river, strove anew, flowed anew. But the ardent voice had changed. It still resounded, sorrowful, seeking, but other voices joined in. Voices of joy and sorrow, good and evil voices, laughing and grieving, a hundred voices, a thousand voices. Siddhartha listened. He was now all ears, utterly engrossed in listening, utterly empty, utterly absorbing. He felt he had now learned all there was to know about listening. He had often heard all these things, these many voices in the river, but today it all sounded new. He could no longer distinguish the many voices, the cheerful from the weeping, the children's from the men's. They all belonged together. The lament of the knower's yearning and laughing, the screaming of the angry, the moaning of the dying, everything was one. Everything was entwined and entwisted, was interwoven a thousandfold. And all of it together, all voices, all goals, all yearnings, all sufferings, all pleasures, all good and evil. The world was everything together. Everything together was the river of events, was the music of life. And when Siddhartha listened attentively to this river, listened to this song of a thousand voices, when he did not listen to sorrow or laughter, when he did not bind his soul to any one voice and did not enter them with his ego but listened to all of them, heard the wholeness, the oneness, then the great song of the thousand voices consisted of a single word, which was Om, perfection. Do you hear? Vasudeva's eyes asked again. Radiant was Vasudeva's smile. It hovered luminous over all the wrinkles in his old face, just as the Om hovered over all the voices of the river. Bright shone his smile when he looked at his friend and bright now glowed the very same smile on Siddhartha's face. His wound blossomed, his sorrow was radiant, his ego had flowed into the oneness. At that moment, Siddhartha stopped fighting with destiny, stopped suffering. On his face, the serenity of knowledge blossomed, knowledge that no will can resist, that knows perfection,
that agrees with the flow of events, with the river of life, full of compassion, full of shared pleasure, devoted to the flowing, belonging to the oneness. When Vasudeva rose from his seat on the river bank, when he looked into Siddhartha's eyes and saw the radiant serenity of knowledge, he touched Siddhartha's shoulder lightly in his cautious and tender way and said, I have waited for this moment, dear friend. Now it has come. Let me go. I have waited and waited for this moment. I was Vasudeva the ferryman for years and years. Now it is enough. Farewell, hut. Farewell, river. Farewell, Siddhartha. Siddhartha bowed low to the departing man. I knew it, he murmured. Will you go into the forest? I am going into the forest. I am going into the oneness, said Vasudeva, radiant. Radiant, he went away. Siddhartha gazed after him, deeply joyous, deeply earnest. He gazed after him, saw his steps full of peace, saw his head full of radiance, saw his figure full of light. Chapter 12 Govinda Once, during a rest period, Govinda was with other monks in the pleasure grove that courtesan Kamala had given to Gautama's disciples. Govinda heard them talk about an old ferryman who lived on the river a day's journey from here and who was viewed by many as a sage. When Govinda wandered on, he chose the way to the ferry eager to see this ferryman. For though Govinda had lived all his life according to the rule and was also revered by the young monks for his age and his modesty, the disquiet and seeking were not snuffed in his heart. He came to the river. He asked the old man to ferry him across. And when they got out on the other side, he said to the old man, You show much goodness to us monks and pilgrims. You have ferried many of us across. Are you not too? Ferryman, a seeker of the right path. Siddhartha, smiling with his old eyes, said, Do you call yourself a seeker, O venerable one? And yet, you are well on in years, and you wear the robe of Gautama's monks. It is true, I am old, said Govinda, but I have not stopped seeking. Never will I stop seeking. This seems to be my destiny. You too, it seems to me, have sought. Will you say a word to me, honored one? Siddhartha said, What could I say to you, venerable one? Perhaps that you are seeking too hard? That you seek so hard that you do not find? What do you mean? asked Govinda. When someone seeks, said Siddhartha, then... It is easily happens that his eyes see only the thing that he seeks, and he is able to find nothing, to take in nothing, because he always thinks only about the thing he is seeking. Because he has one goal, because he is obsessed with his goal. Seeking means having a goal, but finding means being free, being open, having no goal. You, venerable one, may truly be a seeker, For in striving toward your goal, you fail to see certain things that are right under your nose. I do not fully understand, said Govinda. What do you mean by that? Siddhartha said, Once, O venerable one, years ago, you were already on this river, and you saw a sleeper by the river, and you sat with him to guard his sleep. But, O oh, Govinda, you did not recognize the sleeper. Amazed, virtually spellbound, the monk looked into the ferryman's eyes. Are you Siddhartha? He asked in a shy voice. I wouldn't have recognized you this time either. I heartily greet you, Siddhartha. I am heartily delighted to see you again. You've changed greatly, my friend, and so now you've become a ferryman. Siddhartha laughed in a friendly fashion. A ferryman, yes, 
Some people, Govinda, must change greatly, must wear all kinds of clothes. And I am one of those people, dear friend. Welcome, Govinda, and please spend the night in my hut. Govinda spent the night in the hut and slept on the pallet that had once been Vasudeva's pallet. He asked the friend of his youth many questions. Siddhartha had to tell him a lot about his life. The next morning, when it was time to begin his day's wandering, Govinda, not without hesitating, spoke these words. Before I continue on my way, Siddhartha, permit me one last question. Do you have a teaching? Do you have a faith or a knowledge that you follow that helps you live and do right? Siddhartha said, You know, dear friend, as a young man back then, when we lived with the penitents in the forest, I already came to distrust the teachings and the teachers, and I turned my back on them. Nor have I changed in that regard. Nevertheless, I have had many teachers since then. For a long time, a beautiful courtesan was my teacher, and a rich merchant was my teacher, and so were several dicers once, A wandering disciple of the Buddha was my teacher. He sat with me during his pilgrimage when I had fallen asleep in the forest. I learned from him, too. I was thankful to him, too, very thankful. But most of all, I have learned from this river and from my forerunner, Vasudeva, the ferryman. He was a very simple person, Vasudeva. He was no thinker, but he knew what was essential, as well as Gautama did. He was a perfect man. A saint. Govinda said, Oh, Siddhartha, you seem to still like joking a bit. I believe you, and I know that you have not followed any teacher. But have you not found, if not a teaching, then certain thoughts, certain insights that are your own and that help you live? If you told me a little about them, you would delight my heart. Siddhartha said, I have had thoughts, yes, and insights now and then. Sometimes for an hour or for a day, I have felt knowledge in me the way we feel life in our hearts. There were a number of thoughts, but it would be hard for me to communicate them to you. Listen, my Govinda, this is one of my thoughts that I have found. Wisdom cannot be communicated. Wisdom that a wise man tries to communicate always sounds foolish. Are you joking? asked Govinda. I am not joking. I am telling you what I have found. Knowledge can be communicated, but not wisdom. We can find it, we can live it, we can be carried by it, we can work wonders with it, but we cannot utter it or teach it. That was what I sometimes sensed in my youth, what drove me away from the teachers. I have found a thought, Govinda, that you will take again as a joke or as folly, but it is my best thought. This is it. The opposite of every truth is just as true. You see, a truth can be uttered and clad in words only if it is one-sided. One-sided is everything that can be thought with thoughts and said in words. Everything one-sided, everything half, everything is devoid of wholeness, of roundness, of oneness. When the sublime Gautama spoke and talked about the world, he had to divide it into samsara and nirvana, into illusion and truth, into sorrow and salvation. There is no other choice. There is no other way for the man who wishes to teach but the world itself. The being around us and within us is never one-sided. Never is a man or a deed all samsara or all nirvana. Never is a man all saintly or all sinful. It seems otherwise because we are prey to the illusion that time is a reality. But time is not real, Govinda. I have experienced this time and time again, and if time is not real, then the span that seems to lie between world and eternity, between sorrow and bliss, between evil and good, is also an illusion. What do you mean? asked Govinda uneasily. Listen well, dear friend. Listen well. The sinner that I am, and that you are, is a sinner, but some day he will be a Brahmin again, some day he will achieve nirvana, he will be a Buddha. And now listen, this some day is an illusion. 
is merely a metaphor. The sinner is not on the way to becoming a Buddha. He is not involved in a development, although our thinking cannot imagine things in any other way. No, the sinner now and today already contains the future Buddha. His future is fully here. You must worship in the sinner, in you, in everyone, the developing, the possible, the hidden Buddha. The world, my friend Govinda, is not imperfect or developing slowly toward perfection. No, the world is perfect at every moment. All sin already contains grace. All youngsters already contain oldsters. All babies contain death. All the dying contain eternal life. It is not possible for any man to see how far along another man is on his way. Buddha is waiting in robbers and dicers. The robber is waiting in the Brahmin. In deep meditation, it is possible to eliminate time, to see all past, all present, all developing life as coexisting, and everything is good, everything perfect, everything is Brahma. This is why that which is seems good to me. Death seems like life. Sin seems like Satanliness. Cleverness like foolishness. Everything must be like that. Everything needs only my assent, only my willingness, my loving agreement. It is good for me like that. It can never harm me. In my body and in my soul, I realized that I greatly needed sin. I needed lust, vanity, the striving for goods. I needed the most shameful despair to learn how to give up resistance, to learn how to love the world, to stop comparing the world with any world that I wish for, that I imagine, with any perfection that I think up. I learned how to let the world be as it is and to love it and to belong to it gladly. Those... Oh, Govinda, are some of the thoughts that have crossed my mind. Siddhartha bent down, picked up a stone, and weighed it in his hand. This here, he said playfully, is a stone, and perhaps at a certain time it will be soil and will, from soil, become a plant, or an animal, or a human being. Now, earlier, I would have said, this stone is merely a stone, it is worthless, it belongs to the world of Maya. But since in the cycle of transmutations it can also become a man and mind, I grant worth to this stone too. This was what I might have thought earlier. But today I think this is a stone. It is also an animal. It is also God. It is also the Buddha. I love and honor it not because it could become this or that someday, but because it is everything, long since and always. And it is precisely because of this, because it is a stone, because it appears to me now and today as a stone, it is precisely because of this that I love it, and I see worth and meaning in each of its veins and pits, in the yellow, in the gray, in the hardness, in the sound it emits when I tap it in the dryness or dampness of its surface. There are stones that feel like oil or like soap, and others like leaves, still others like sand, and each is special, and praise the Om in its own way. Each is Brahma. But at the same time, and just as much as it is a stone, it is oily or soapy, and that is precisely what I like, and what seems wonderful to me, and worthy of worship. But I will say no more about it. Words are not good for the secret meaning. Everything instantly becomes a bit different when we utter it. A bit adulterated, a bit mm, foolish, yes. And that, too, is very good and appeals to me. I also very much agree that one man's treasure and wisdom always sound like foolishness to another. Govinda listened in silence. Why did you tell me about the stone? He hesitantly asked after a pause. It was unintentional, or perhaps I meant that I love the stone and the river and all the things that we contemplate and from which we can learn. I can love a stone, Govinda, and also a tree or a piece of bark. These are things, and things can be loved, but I cannot love words. That is why teachings mean nothing to me. They have no hardness, no softness, no colors, no edges, no smell, no taste. They have nothing but words. Perhaps that is what keeps you from finding peace. Perhaps it is the many words. For redemption and virtue, samsara and nirvana are also mere words, Govinda. There is no thing that is nirvana. There is only the word nirvana. 
Govinda said, Nirvana, my friend, is not only a word, it is also a thought. Siddhartha went on, A thought, that may be. I must confess to you, dear friend, I barely distinguish between thoughts and words. Frankly, I have little esteem for thoughts. I have more esteem for things. Here, on this ferry, for example, there was a man, my forerunner and teacher, a saintly man. For years he simply believed in the river and in nothing else. He noticed that the river's voice spoke to him. He learned from its voice. It raised and taught him. The river seemed like a god to him. For many years he did not know that every wind, every cloud, every bird, every bug is just as godly and knows and can teach just as much as the venerated river. But when this saint went into the forest, he knew everything, knew more than you and I, without teachers, without books, only because he believed in the river. Govinda said, but... Is what you call things something real? Something essential? Are they too not a mirage of Maya, merely image and semblance, your stone, your tree, your river? Are they realities? This too, said Siddhartha, does not trouble me greatly. Whether things are semblances or not, I too am a semblance after all. And so they are always my peers. This is what makes them so dear to me and venerable. They are my peers. That is why I can love them. Now, this is a teaching that you will laugh at. Love, O Govinda, seems paramount to me. Seeing through the world, explaining it, despising it, may be crucial to great thinkers, but all I care about is to be able to love the world, not to despise it, not to hate it or myself, to be able to view it and myself and all beings with love and admiration and awe. I understand that, said Govinda, but that was the very thing that he, the sublime one, recognized as mirage. He taught benevolence, indulgence, compassion, tolerance, but not love. He forbade us to fetter our hearts in love for anything earthly. I know, said Siddhartha. His smile beamed, golden. I know, Govinda, and look. Here we are in the midst of the thicket of opinions, in the fight over words, for I cannot deny that my words about love contradict, seem to contradict. Gautama's words, that is precisely why I so greatly distrust words, for I know that this contradiction is an illusion. I know that I am one with Gautama. How could he then not know also love? He who recognized all humanness in its ephemeralness, in its vanity, and yet loved human beings so much that he devoted a long and arduous life purely to helping them, to teaching them. Even with him, even with this great teacher, the things are dearer to me than words, his life and deeds more important than his speaking, the gestures of his hands more important than his opinions. I see his greatness not in speaking, not in thinking, but only in doing, in living. For a long time, the two old men kept silent. Then Govinda spoke as he bowed before departing. I thank you, Siddhartha, for telling me something of your thoughts. Some of your thoughts are strange. I did not understand all of them right away. Be that as it may, I thank you and I wish you peaceful days. But secretly, he thought, this Siddhartha is a peculiar person. He utters peculiar thoughts. His teaching sounds foolish. The pure teaching of the sublime one sounds different, sounds clearer, purer, more intelligible. There is nothing strange, foolish, or laughable about it. However, Siddhartha's hands and feet, his eyes, his brow, his breathing, his smile, his greeting, his gait, seem different from his thoughts. Never since our sublime Gautama entered Nirvana, never have I met another man about whom I felt. This is a saint. I have felt this way only about him, this Siddhartha. His teaching may be strange, his words may sound foolish, but his eyes and his hands, his skin and his hair, everything about him radiates a purity, radiates a peace, radiates a mildness and serenity and saintliness, which I have seen in no other person since the final death of our sublime teacher. With these thoughts and a conflict in his heart, 
Govinda bowed once more to Siddhartha, drawn by love. Deeply, he bowed to the peaceful sitter. Siddhartha, he said, we are old men now. We will scarcely meet again in this incarnation. I see, dear friend, that you have found peace. I confess that I have not found it. Give me, my honored friend, another word. Give me something that I can grasp, that I can understand. Give me something to take along on my way. My way is often arduous. It is often dark, Siddhartha. Siddhartha silently looked at him with his still and unchanging smile. Govinda stared into Siddhartha's face with his fear, with yearning. Sorrow and eternal seeking were written in his gaze. Eternal failure to find. Siddhartha saw it and smiled. Lean toward me, he whispered in Govinda's ear. Lean toward me here. Right, a bit closer, very close. Kiss my forehead, Govinda. But while Govinda, surprised and yet drawn by great love and premonition, obeyed Siddhartha's words, leaned over to him and touched his foreheads with his lips, something wonderful happened to him. While his thoughts still dwelled on Siddhartha's peculiar words, while he vainly and reluctantly tried to think time away to imagine nirvana and samsara as one, while a certain scorn for his friend's words struggled in him with tremendous love and reverence, this happened to him. He no longer saw his friend Siddhartha's face. Instead, he saw other faces, many a long row, a streaming river of faces, hundreds, thousands, which all came and faded and yet seemed all to be there at once, which kept changing and being renewed, and yet which all were Siddhartha. He saw the face of a fish, a carp with a mouth opened in infinite pain, a dying fish with breaking eyes. He saw the face of a newborn child, red and wrinkled, twisted with weeping. He saw the face of a murderer, saw him plunge a knife in another man's body. He saw in the same second this criminal chained and kneeling with his head chopped off by a stroke of the executioner's axe. He saw the naked bodies of men and women in positions and struggles of raging love. He saw corpses stretched out, still cold, empty. He saw the heads of animals, of boars, of crocodiles, of elephants, of bulls, of birds. He saw God, saw Krishna, saw Anye. He saw all these shapes and faces in a thousand interrelations, each helping the others, loving them, hating them, destroying them, bearing them anew. Each was a desire to die, a passionately painful confession of ephemeralness, and yet none died. Each was merely transformed, kept being reborn, kept receiving a new face with no time between one face and the other. And all these shapes and faces rested, flowed, produced themselves, and one another floated away and poured into one another. And yet, drawn over all of them, there was constantly something thin, something unsubstantial, yet existing, like thin glass or ice like a transparent skin, a shell, or form, or mask of water. And this mask smiled, and this mask was Siddhartha's smiling face that he, Govinda, touched with his lips at that very same moment. And Govinda saw that this smile of the mask, this smile of the oneness over the streaming formations, this smile of simultaneity, Over the thousand births and deaths, this smile of Siddhartha's was exactly the same, was exactly the identical, still, fine, impenetrable, perhaps kindly, perhaps quizzical, wise, thousandfold smile of Gautama, the Buddha, as himself, Govinda, had seen it with awe a hundred times. This, Govinda knew, was how the perfect ones smiled. No longer knowing whether time existed, whether this seeing had lasted a second or a century, no longer knowing whether a Siddhartha existed, or a Gautama, or I and thou, wounded in his innermost as if by a godly arrow, whose wounding tasted sweet, enchanted, and dissolved in his innermost. 
Govinda stood for a brief while, leaning over Siddhartha's silent face, which he had just kissed, which had just been the setting of all formations, all becoming, all being. The face was unaltered after the depth of the thousandfold forms had closed again under its surface. He was still smiling, smiling softly and quietly, perhaps very gently, perhaps very mockingly, just as he had smiled, the sublime one. Govinda bowed low. Tears ran over his old face, but he was unaware of them. The feeling of deepest love, of humblest veneration burned in his heart like a fire. He bowed low, down to the ground, bowed to the motionless sitter, whose smile reminded him of everything that he had ever loved in his life, that had ever been valuable and holy to him in his life.